Hello, welcome to another exciting episode of the Create and Grow podcast. And I am excited to have a wonderful guest with me today, someone who I've known for what, 30 years now, over 30 years now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We actually came uh, to the earth from the same person. But the reason why I'm bringing him here is to talk about the marriage of the arts and sciences. If any of you have been following my recent postings, we've been really talking about what's going on in the brain when when you are active in the arts and how being in a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, how that plays out in the workforce and what are the true attributes and abilities and skills do people need in order to be adaptable, to be resilient, and to be able to pivot and, and be creative in a VUCA type of environment? And I'm so excited to have our guest here to talk about a wonderful event that just happened last week and how this applies to the workforce and the future of work. Joseph Jefferson, welcome to the Create and Grow podcast. You are my younger brother. I have to stop saying little brother because you're not so little, but you are my younger brother. And it's just amazing to bring you onto the show finally and just to talk everything science, everything arts, everything neuroscience, and really give America, give the world a new perspective on what to look out for for this future of work and also where, where science is going and what you see. Welcome to, to the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be here and definitely want to get into all these topics. They're, they're really great. Wonderful, wonderful. So really quick, just give us a background about uh, what you do and a little bit of who you are. Yeah, so I'm a flight systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so I'm currently operating two spacecraft that orbit the Earth. One is called SMAP, which stands for Soil Moisture Active Passive. And um, that one looks for microwave emissions from the Earth to um, see how much moisture is in the soil. Um, and so where you're at right now, they have mapped how much moisture is in the soil beneath your house or beneath your office building, wherever you're at, at a park. Um, we know how much soil um, moisture is there and that um, helps predict and um, that data is used for um, uh, weather prediction to drought um, predictions, uh, um, climate science, and a whole bunch of different and myriad of, of, of um, applications. Um, so that, that's a great mission to work with. And, um, and my other mission is called NeoWise, um, which um, used to be the WISE mission and was using a um, infrared telescope to um, do a survey, all sky survey of the entire sky in the infrared wavelength um, to find potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, and so that's also a neat one because uh, if there's an asteroid coming our way, you know, you see me doing some stuff that like, well, what is Joey doing over there? That's probably why, because we don't have much time on this earth. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> um, well, so, I mean, that makes us aware of, of how much we aren't aware of what's actually going on around us and the things that you all are aware of, NASA is aware of, right? Them all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, my job is to operate the spacecraft. And so we work with a, a bunch of different teams called subsystems. And so there's like a navigation subsystem, which helps define and predict the trajectory the spacecraft is going, like the path that the spacecraft is flying through. Um, there's the power subsystem, the thermal subsystem, there's guidance and navigation, which deals with attitude and how the spacecraft is positioned in space. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that the systems engineer, who is kind of like the leader in, in, in working and bringing them all together, integrating them all into one final working product, um, that's what we do. And so we also look for alarms and anything that's wrong with the spacecraft, we figure that out and go to the appropriate subsystems or figure it out ourselves. Um, and and 24 seven monitor, monitoring um, of, of the spacecraft to make sure it's healthy. And that's pretty much what I do. That's just a little bit of what we do, right? Just like this massive thing, just, just on a Tuesday, we're just stopping that asteroids from hitting the earth. <laughs> it's a normal Wednesday for us. So, well, number one, thank, thank you uh, from one public servant to another. Thank, thank you for, for your service, for helping protect our nation and our world. And 
you have just number one you've really op opened up a lot of things for us to see and you've opened up a lot lot of uh, connections for me to see when i start to see you in your work in your serious science work but also knowing your background talk to me a little bit about your music background how did you get started on the 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 rinky piano in our garage growing up so, what did that look like and what pushed you um to where you are today yeah credit that to my other sister jeanette who taught me um uh, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata and um, for Elise. Those are the first two songs I learned and I just loved it um, in the in our garage and my, in my grandma's old piano. Um, and then I got a little bit more formal introduction through um, clarinet in elementary school and the middle school. And then I did performance for clarinet um, in college as a double major. Um, and, and so that's what kind of got me into more serious piano as well because I had to take piano classes. And then I fell in love with piano. And then that was a real birth of being more serious in music um, and learning about music theory and the relationship between the arts and mathematics and sciences. And that kind of birthed that theory right, right there in college and started all that. Awesome, awesome. And there's so much there we, we can talk about. I just want to really just let the audience know of what blew my mind last week. I was at Caltech, which is in California, a university in California, um, California Tech, Tech, Technical University. Is that the official name? Um, California um, Institute of Technology. Okay, thank you. I was like, and they, I think it was their program, their tacit program, they have put on a theater. And so, what is this partnership between Caltech and JPL NASA? So um, we're technically Caltech employees with NASA funding, but are still a NASA field center. And so it's a unique relationship because of how JPL was founded. Um, it was Caltech students and they didn't want them firing rockets at Caltech because this is when rocketry was just being developed and everything. And there were just, you know, explosives and they're like, so go in the mountains and do that. And so at the time that area was really wasn't developed and um, it's it birthed the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then from there, Caltech has um, remained in connection with JPL and NASA kind of made it a field center um, like 10 years later um, and, and, you know, really brought together robotics and, um, and help bring up the first uh, satellite Explorer one from the US. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. And you also worked on the Mars 2020 project, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so that was yeah. more for the deep space network work and, um, and formulating and helping to formulate and conceive and then negotiate and implement their antenna strategy so they can communicate from Mars back to Earth. Um, so that was that was really fun. Caltech and JPL NASA, they put on a show. Let let us show the let, let me see if I get this working. Let's show show some footage from the show. <laughs> All right, from the earth to the moon. I thought I was just going to support my little brother in a small community play <laughs> or whatever. And it didn't be up like almost like this off Broadway level. Like everyone was on on point, every the pitch, the singing, everything was beautiful. Have you ever heard of this play before that you auditioned for it? So it is actually the first time the play was ever done. Um, oh, so really? Mm -hmm, the two brothers oh, wow. um, okay. who wrote it. One's an astrophysicist and the other is a playwright. And so they wrote this, this play from a Jules Verne um, book. He wrote 20,000 20, Leagues Under the Sea. Um, and they he wrote this other one called From the Earth to the Moon. Um, just this ridiculous story of firing a projectile to the moon from a cannon that's 500, 900 feet long in the earth and putting people inside of there. And they went to the moon and it's just like, it's all ridiculous, but it's really fun because, you know, they hadn't been in space yet when you wrote it. And this is the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so to see how they thought of space and then how the brothers weaved in music and storyline and, and a love dynamic and a villain and all of these different things was really interesting and fun to be a part of. 
So, wait, this play was never performed before? No, it, it was brand new. So we worked wow. with the playwrights. Um, and, okay, and, but they wrote it when? When was the play written? Um, last year. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but the set, the setting of, of the play was in the 1800s. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. And so it's from a book um, from Jules Verne. He wrote a book. Okay. Got from okay. Her. Awesome, awesome. So one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring you on, number one, just to talk about the music and science connection, is that this whole, the play staff, the team, um, they are all, or most of them, are all scientists, math mathematicians, engineers, biologists. Yeah. And, you know, come on, there's a bias out there that, like, if you're, if you're deep in the STEM, then there's no A going on. There's no arts, arts going on. And they feel that a lot of these these fields are se separate, which if you've done your re research, you know, a lot of our greatest mathematicians and scientists, they have some type of arts background. Mm -hmm. And I often talk about Albert Einstein, who played the violin, uh, the person who invented the, the stethoscope was a, a, a advanced flute player. So he had very, you know, high observational skills. And I just wanted people to see some more, some more clips just to say, wow, everyone is a deep science, math, biology person, but look at their their advance, and they, they're not like you know the fifth grade level type of theater production, right? Um, what what was your experience just with this cast? Um, yeah, it was very very fun to be around like minded people. Like we have some people that are developing instruments, going to Europa, um, the Europa mission. Um, we have people that just developed an instrument at the moon and it's a, from the earth to the moon is the play. So the, the director kept talking about jokes of, you know, there's people actually like make stuff go on the moon. So we should be able to do this in our sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and then and the Caltech students from graduate level down to um, freshmen, all just doing interesting work and everybody was really collaborative and talking about the things they loved. But then they also had this love for the art. And for me, spacecraft development science all of these things are art forms right that's why we call it a state of the art and you have to be creative to unlock technology that hasn't been thought of before or created yet and you ha it takes a creative mind to that is well versed and has a strong foundation in their craft to create new parts of their craft and that comes from the creative mind. And so when you exercise that part of your mind, when you when you start asking questions why, you become wise, you know? And that is that is what I believe why um, people that start to make major breakthroughs, number one, have a good foundation in their work, but secondly, have some kind of creative outlet or creative muscle working within them. Wonderful, wonderful. And you know, when I do my definition of creativity, I don't just mean artistry, and people are very aware of that if they've been following my, my work. But I am a huge advocate of advocating for the arts and saying, okay, well, how does that support us in non-creative areas? And that's why I just love talking to you over and over again, because you are the epitome of someone who is in a non-arts profession or, or job yet you bring and a lot of your co-workers co-work bring in the arts in just even if it's su subtle or even if it's not the main thing it's still working in the background in your brain your music you know your you you, you paint I remember when when you and I were spending a lot of time together you were you were paint, painting and expressing expressing that that way and what elements of musical theater because that is a beautiful way to practice this you have the music you have the theater you have the artistic the visual arts right of, of the setting the clothes and and the design and and the dance you were dancing there watching you, you dance was awesome this it's just like it's like a, a a quadruple threat what elements from this these four arts do you see yourself bringing into your profession um one uh, perspective so looking at things from different perspectives um, is very important. Um, it was funny because when you're on stage, everything feels a lot slower. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking, you can be talking really fast. You don't even know it because on stage, everything time kind of slows down. Um, and speaking of Einstein, talking about time, time is malleable, so it makes sense. Um, and when you're 
Um, but on the opposite side, when you're giving energy, you may think you're giving a lot of energy, but in reality, it looks kind of like weak and not very like, oh, I'm here, oh, like that. Like you gotta be even extra like, to the point where it's ridiculous for it to look somewhat like you have energy on stage. Um, and so all these different plays of perspectives and, and, and seeing the, what the audience may see is not what exactly you're experiencing. And so like looking at yourself on camera, all these different things are really important. And so the same thing for, you know, different spacecraft work, when you're deep inside of a certain problem or you're trying to formulate a new type of technology or develop a spacecraft, you can get kind of bogged down with seeing the same thing over and over and over and over again and not taking a step back and living life and coming back at the problem with new perspectives and new idea and, and a new fresh mind um, will hurt you more than it helps you. Um, and that's why I, you know, taking a break and s stepping away from your work for me is really important. Um, and, and most people kind of burn out and they just kind of, oh, I need to finish, I need to finish it. And they read their same song 20,000 times to the point where it's just mush and you know they, they don't have the, the fresh mind to come and see it. And a lot of songwriters employ that. Yes, I have the seven gems of intercultural creativity. And one of the gems is perspective taking and perspective shifting. And what does that look like when you're talking about empathy? What does that look like when you're talking about team building, leadership, right? And of course, imagination. You mentioned it earlier, the power of imagination. And, and, and people don't really think, you know, the importance of that word, especially in your field where you are you and your team and your organization are really on the on the frontier, right? As as they said in Star Trek, the final frontier, right? And of course, of course, your imagination has to come come to play. That would be absurd not to think about it. But what things do we do on our downtime to really exercise? And I love that you use that word because it says that hey, I can get stronger at this if I exercise, which is wonderful. Thanks so much for for bringing that up. Emotional intelligence. This is a big word in the business world, in the science world, in the education world, right? Emotional intel intelligence. How do you feel playing music and now doing a musical theater? How do you feel that your emotional intelligence has grown through these activities? Um, very much so. Uh, you know, getting into a character, feeling the anger, feeling the the love and the happiness, the the frustration, all of these different things, you have to know what they are to be able to pull them out of something, you know, and you have to know how to control them to be able to bring them out of out of a out of a hat. Um, and in all more performative arts, emotion is so important because without emotion, the audience can't feel you. Right? Like you feel me? Like <laughs> feelings come our emotions themselves are feelings. And so to be able to be felt, you have to have emotion. And so, um, you know, and then from on the side, you have to be able to control them on in the more in the STEM based world and stuff. And when you get frustrated, when you all these things that want to bring down your work output and um, stifle you and paralyze you, you have to compartmentalize carp carp or heal whatever is happening to be able to continue your work. Um, but, but yeah, as far as emotional intelligence, it's huge and it's fun because, you know, you, when I'm backstage and I was about to go on and I was battling the villain nickel, um, you know, I was really thinking like this dude wrote all these letters about me and he did this, 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 and he was so rude and it was so awful. And in reality, like none of that's happening. It's all story, but, uh, <laughs> but I had to do that to be able to create the anger of what someone really did this to me, how I would feel. And then I went on stage with that feeling. Yes, and I wish I had that clip. I don't have that one, but I do have this one. And at this club, this soul pump, our own inventions, their intentions, none too pure. To be sure, far all behind us now, our future's gonna start. So take heart, let our projectile reach that twice. I just I I love that because Dr. Lisa Philbin Barrett she talks about a term called emotional granularity, and she says that people who are able to label their emotions, especially be more specific about their 
labeling so they can identify more specific emotions it's, instead of you know you know um my son your nephew he, he can get angry you know but is it angry is it mad is it frustrated is it perturbed you know and so we're working on him being more specific with what type of emotion and then labeling it and her work says that if you're able to label it on a more specific identification level you're able to really have a better action plan you know, as yeah. opposed to just being happy and sad and angry. I have three emotions and that's it. You know, and I bet you know some adults who just they don't know how to <laughs> how to yeah. identify or correctly label and then work out an action plan. So people who are more emotionally aware um, and their emotion, they're able to label it. But I think what you're saying also is that increases your emotional awareness because you have to fabricate and to right. really get in these emotions that aren't really Joseph's experience, they're, they're your character's experience. Yeah, and when you're aware of your emotions, you can control your emotions instead of letting your emotions control you. And I think that's the goal, you know, because mm -hmm. we all live life and life is gonna bring unexpected circumstances that's going to naturally bubble up emotions for your, from your subconscious. And to be able to be aware of it and know what's happening. Why am I angry? Why is this happening? Oh, it's because of this, this, this. Oh, do I need to act on this? I don't need to act on this. Then I'm good. Versus having no idea why you're angry, not knowing to ask those questions and, and just being angry and letting it affect your day when it probably had nothing to do with you in the first place. And not that, in. Yeah, that's huge. Huge, huge. And I think this is the decade for people taking this more seriously. You're seeing more of a presence in K-12 with social emotional learning in, in the curriculum. But what does it look like in the workforce, in the professional development curriculum? What does that look like and how can we bring in the arts to help support people in their emotional and self-awareness? What does that look like? And that's another reason why I wanted to bring you on, because that's a great point that you brought, brought up. And this was your first musical? Yeah, yeah. So talk did, about that. I did an opera before, um, while I was in my master's at Cal Poly, but this was a whole different animal. And so, what originally what happened was I just got out of a breakup, and so I, I had a lot of time on my hands. And all of a sudden, this email popped up and said, "Hey, looking for JPLers that want to be in this musical at Caltech." And I was like, "You know what? This would be fun." And I went and audition, and they were like, "Ooh, we have a good part for you." It's the Captain Barbicane. It's kind of a lot of lines, but we think you can do it. You have the presence for it and the voice. And I was like, okay. I had no <laughs> idea how many lines I had to learn <laughs> and songs I had to learn and all the dancing and the blocking. And, you know, I was in rehearsals 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. every Saturday for seven months, you know, and then going through the Omicron and we didn't know if we we're going to do it. And it was, it is, I have a new respect for people like on Broadway and, and you know, I did not know it was this like complicated and the energy you have to put into it is just next level, but the accomplishment and the feeling of accomplishment you get afterwards and the, the audience like honoring the work they see through, you know, just being there and present and laughing and the applause and everything, it feels amazing. And so it's completely worth it. Oh, there's there's so much there. First of all, I want to talk about uh, what you said at the beginning. I I, I you know I, I taught at the K twelve or K five level, and I actually co ran the drama club as well. Yeah. And there was one year that we that we did the Lion King, you know, yes. and we had huge masks, and it was it was amazing. I loved it. And we had a little boy who was like kind of like labeled the class clown, you know, that kid that always makes jokes, and he was I think it was fifth grade. I'll never forget this. And he never did theater before. Class clown, always joked around. And the teachers were like, yeah, we're not going to give him a lead because, you know, he's the, like the jokester. He's probably not going to take it seriously. But something in my heart said, no, I got I got to fight for for this one. I think he can pull it off. I, I think he he can do it because if he can joke in class clown in class and make people laugh, he has a stage. Like I'm, I'm the one trying to find these underlying yeah. attributes and yeah. see if we direct it towards a purpose, mm. I think he can pull it off. And I said, hey, do you want Scar? And you know, Scar is not a minor role. <laughs> Scar is a major role. And yeah, I was, I was just like, and I looked at, I remember the, the, when the roles were being passed out, I was like, I, I fought for you. I need you to commit to this. I think you can do it. Do you want to take this on? And he said, okay, I'll take it on. And you were there. Yeah, he, awesome. You yeah. thought he'd yeah. been acting for like, 10 years and the boy is 10 years old amazing. and he, he did an amazing job and i remember the last show 
I just looked at, I almost was crying. I was like, not only did he do a great job, like this could be his path, you know? And it was a beautiful thing. And so I I wanted to bring that up with what you said of of your, your directors looking at you and saying, you've never been in a musical before, but we think you can pull this off. What, What did that feel like? Yeah, it, it felt good. Um, and then there was a little bit of an imposter syndrome, um, which this whole thing taught me a lesson to never trust that feeling whenever it comes up. Um, because you really truly can do anything you put your mind to. Um, it just takes, you know, hard work and, um, and putting your head down and just getting through it. But um, yeah, there was a little bit of imposter syndrome because I had never done this before. And there were people around me that have done like, this is my 17th musical. And this is my <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you know this musical? I'm like, I don't know this musical. And I'm like, oh yes. And I'm just like, oh man, what did I get myself into? <laughs> Can I do this? Definitely high levels of anxiety started coming. And I'm a naturally anxious person, so that wasn't fun. But um, you know, our mother taught us that once you start something, you never quit it. And I just, you know, started doing iteration. And so to me, iteration is creation. And so learning the lines, I just kept repeating it over and over and over and over again until it became part of me. And once I had that confidence, I started to build upon that and then, you know, do the blocking and then do all these different things. And, and, and it just kept building until I got the play down. Um, and so, but yes, I'm not going to lie. I definitely had imposter syndrome. I was like, this, this I, I can't do this. I'm going to make them all fail right now. <laughs> Wow. Everywhere. And then not only did you do it, but like my student, like little Scar, you blew everyone out the water, you know, and I was just like, I was sitting next to our, my, my twin, your sister. And I was like, I can't, I can't believe that's Joseph. Is that Joseph? I can't believe that's Joseph. <laughs> you know, um, and, and another thing that Dr. Kelly talks about, I forgot her last name, but I was researching her for a class I'm teaching on, on building trust and the neurochemicals in the brain of what happens when you build trust is she was talking about about um, her work with with rats basically and rats who receive who did have to do the work to get a reward as opposed to rats who just got a reward just for like laying laying there um, or whatever and she says the rats who had to work to get a reward you know they now have that experiential capital to do harder things mm. is that what you 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 feel absolutely um, you know I, I'm very fond of doing the work. And when you do the work, you work like a light bulb, you know? <laughs> I think those two things are not um, coincidental. And, um, you know, and the equation for power, for instance, is work times time, right? So the same amount of time, if you do more work, it's multiplied. And so it's a multiplicate, multiplicative factor, not just um, work plus time, right? And so it gives you power, you become empowered you get more energy when you do more work for yourself. And, and this is not discounting taking and resting because it's a wave, flat line is death. So if you work, 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 you're gonna die. If you sit, 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 you're gonna die. And so it needs to be work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. But I just love doing the work and getting into it and really challenging myself because when you come out of that, it creates momentum and it allows you to see all the different possibilities that many people have fear for it's, i can't do that no i can't i can't i'll embarrass myself oh, whatever those are and just put them all out the window and the more you do it the more momentum you have and the, the higher heights you can reach i believe that and we're going to see you reach some high heights now yes but we'll need to rely on public support to get this project done true is this your way of volunteering to handle the press you know i'd do anything for the club if that's what you want. Then the position's yours! Oh, too kind! Then my first order of business must be this wager. If you mean Captain Nick, who else? I've already handled that. So it's true. And you had a great, great cast. And, you know, I brought my, my son there and we had our, uh, our, our nephew and niece there, JR and Layla, who are five and seven, and my son is four. And even though the play started at 7.30 and his like bedtime is eight, I was like, I was very adamant to make sure that the children were there to see you and to see the other cast mem- members there. You have uh, Joshua Morgan, who's applied physics and who's a systems in- engineer, to name a few. 
And then, of course, your amazing director who I spoke to, he said he, said he loved your work. And you have uh, Tai Kong, who's a Caltech senior in computer science and, and Caltech. And I wanted them to see it, you know, because the power of seeing people and especially seeing you, right, someone they know, they know personally on stage is more than just me just talking about it. Them actually seeing it and being around the music. And Sean, my son, watches these videos over and over again on his iPad because I put him there. But I want to talk about Katherine Johnson, who worked for for NASA a few decades ago. And I remember having a conversation with you. I said, Joseph, have you ever heard of Katherine Johnson? Right. And you said before the movie, what did you, you, you say? I didn't. You know. And tell me, what was your thoughts about that? It was going into work the next day was a different experience because you know that you're walking on the sh giant's that have paved the road before you and it becomes a more serious endeavor and you know there's a lot of times again the imposter syndrome can come in which causes you know paralysis and um, stops you from doing work that you can and know that you should be doing because you're afraid of what if i fail all these different things but when you look at that and her running in heels across the lab just to use the bathroom and still doing it and being one of the reasons why uh, the first man to orbit the earth happened, that is something that is like, I have nothing to complain about. And I should be super grateful that I'm here because of her work. And now it's my turn to do higher levels of work as much as I possibly can because I'm given more opportunity because the world is a little bit different because of her and because of those, those sacrifices. And hopefully the world will be a little bit different for JR and he can reach even higher heights and Sean and Layla and the next generation. And, yes. and that's, you know, that's what it's about. Um, but yeah, I, I was very mad and, you know, I don't think that was by, you know, per, uh, uh, like, I don't think that was by accident. I didn't know who she was, but you know, God has a way of making things happen and making things known that should be known at the right time. And it was exactly what I needed to push me into another level of, you know, hard work and, and taking the serious this opportunity. And as an educator, I'm going to say that that I agree with you. It wasn't by mistake. And I'm that's why we're doing the work that we're, we're doing, because the reason the reason why I bring up this example is because you are in science, you're at NASA and you're an African-American uh, person. So if anyone should know who this woman is, it should have been you. Right. Maybe not me, because I'm not a math mathematician. I didn't really do the hard math classes. But what does that say to our next generation who aren't seeing the faces that can communicate them subconsciously? Hey, if they can do it. I can do it, too. Like, what if you knew about Katherine Johnson in the fifth grade? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been a completely different situation. Um, you know, when I got the JPL internship, my mom was like, it's JPL. And I was like, no, mom, I don't think I'm going to get this. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. It's just too big. Like, I just, I, I'm not ready for this at all. And, you know, I'm a little bit older I am, you know, and so it's exactly that. And, and we, mm -hmm. and we gratefully had, had, a, you know, parents and, and a mother that for sure pushed us and knew it, you know, the, the, the expansiveness of creativity. And that's why I dedicate the intercultural creativity idea to my mother, because she built a home of intercultural creativity, of going beyond where we, how far we think we can go and, and con connecting with people who may not look like us or believe like, like us, but still being open-minded to, to make connections and learn from everyone. That was a culture that we were raised in and you see it manifesting in what you and I are both are doing today. And hopefully we can keep spreading that even beyond our own family to other people who you know read our books and who will, will be seeing your keynotes coming up you know, within in the, the next year and hopefully your book coming up. Can you talk to us about what you believe your message is going to be, at least right now, because messages do change and evolve, but, but what is your message right now? Yeah, so my whole thing right now, the culmination of it all is called frequency. And frequency in a scientific term um, is a number of iterations over a period of time. Uh, and so that's why I always say iteration is creation because frequency is integral into everything. So how you emit energy, when someone comes in a room really angry and you can feel it, that is their energy radiating from them. Everything inside of you right now vibrates. 
And so everything inside of you has a certain frequency, even your consciousness, even how your neurons are communicating with each other, they're vibrating at the same phase in the same motion, how a tuning fork can be wrong and another one starts feeling it too. All of these things are connected to each other. The same way we communicate, what maybe really made me think about this is how we communicate in spacecraft, how one will have a frequency, we tune it. So that's why, are you tuned to me? Kind of vibe, or they're, they're not in tune. And it's the same thing how we communicate with spacecraft. The antenna is tuned to the spacecraft itself and they're able to communicate with each other. And so I started seeing these connections between spirituality, like concepts like duality, um, consciousness, all of these, um, uh, uh, topics that are really coming into the forefront of um, you know, the nation's consciousness right now, and science and music and art. Um, for instance, in Japan, duality is really important. Like Sh the, comp the composer of Japan, even Beethoven does the same thing, where he'll play something, then repeat it. Go into a transition phase, play something, repeat it. A little bit different. Go to a transition phase, play something, repeat it. And that's that concept of duality. We like things to be done again. In jazz, there's a term that says, say it again. So you do a phrase and then you do it again. And if you listen to music like this, things are done in loops. Same thing in hip hop. You'll hear loops at different levels, a certain kick to a certain pattern and then repeat itself. And so this is all frequency. This is all iterations over time. And as I noticed that, I started getting into the nitty gritty of how that can be used, these ideas that is integral everywhere, right? Waves are everywhere. Light waves, sound waves, ocean waves, waves and music, waves and art, different ways. Like you need to have the to and fro, the up and down, the back and forth to make something interesting, to give it movement. Um, and so I thought, how can this be used in creation and, and creating? And what I really noticed is it really comes from this work rest, work, rest, work, rest, builds momentum. If you look at a piano frequency, it's exponential. So the lower notes all have kind of near the same frequencies, then all of a sudden the middle notes start to build their frequencies and the top notes are exponential in how the frequency builds because the momentum is being built. And so that's huge. And so as long as you Keep, keep that up. A lot of people do work, rest, 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 rest. <laughs> it's done. Or work, 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 And, and to, to jump in really quick, you're seeing a lot of articles, especially on, you know, Harvard Business Review and, and Business Week about burnout. Yeah, exactly. And that's what that is, because there's a reason why we sleep, right? That duality is there too, right? We're just not awake all the time. There's a reason in the in the Christian Bible that God rested when he's God, he can literally go like that and, and, and nearly in every single in every single religious text. And so once I saw that, I was like, OK, there's something really here. And the missing point is the connections between all these areas that I've been blessed to learn about and get some experience in. And so I feel like this is really my purpose, especially to bring spirituality to the sciences, which um, tends to be more um, atheist or agnostic and um, not in these kind of concepts, even though personally, I think they're really closely related. Um, and yeah, and to use it to create, which I believe is the only reason why we're here is to create art and make something to make it, while we're making, you know, <laughs> say that, say, say that, that again, to make it, like I made it to make it, you need to make it, you need to actually make it to make it. Like, and so that's what I, think. I like it. I like it. And so I am here to support you because, you know, I personally believe I, I tell people that I was not sad when Maya Angelou died because that was the epitome of a life well lived. Like she did it. You know, it was time for her to go. She gave us everything she had to give us. And if we still want to learn from her, like I can go pick up a book, go find a YouTube video, go go look at a play, go read some of, of her writings. Like yeah. everything you just said is perfect. She she made it and then she left it and then she went on her her, her way. And uh, that is what we're trying to communicate to people. A hundred years is not a long time in the history of the earth. It's not even a breath, right? It's so quick. So so instead of us burning out and just trying to pay the light bill, what are we supposed to make during our short time here? And I, I believe you're really onto something. There's a wonderful book that I have to send you called Hustled and, and Float. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's a it's a similar concept, but she did, of course, d doesn't bring any of the arts or in any of the frequency to it. But just talking about um, uh, rest, you know, that that back and forth, yin, yin and yang, resting and, and working. Um, but I think your edge um, reminds me of the quote from Johann Johannesson, the book, The Medici Effect by Franz Johannesson, where he says innovation is at the intersection of disciplines, fields and cultures. And when I see you, when I see me and 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 our, our brothers and our, our brothers, our, our sisters and, and our family, mom made us made us aware that we need to be at the intersection of these things, you know, trying different things, trying different, um, you know, arts and sports and activities and meeting different people where we were always at the intersection, sometimes the only black family at the location of the intersection. I'm like, we're at the Niagara Falls and no one else here looks like us, but mom's like, okay, let's go have fun, yay, you know? And, and that's a beautiful thing that you and I try to try to connect and share with other people who may not have had that experience growing up. And um, so so with that, we're gonna close close off because I know you have to get back to, to, to protecting our, our, our world. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to get back to make, making a uh, curriculum so I can teach this stuff. But people are saying STEM, STEM, STEM. Why are you advocating for STEAM? Why are you advocating for that A inside of STEM? Yeah, art is the basis of creation, right? And so every single field within STEM has a need for a creative mind. And so without the A, there is no STEM. It's really all interconnected. That's the reason why it's all in the world and why it's so revered, why we honor artists so much and they get paid millions and millions and millions of dollars and get seen by thousands and thousands of people in one night. It's because we resonate with the hard work to create something new within the space of art. And it's not just an iPhone that's beautiful. It's Adele singing. And it's not just a Mac that's awesome. It's Beyonce dancing on stage and singing and doing it at a high level and creating new sounds that we never heard before and all these different things. And so for both to work really nicely, trust me, I can tell you there's not many engineers who are working and studying without listening to music, right? And without <laughs> taking a break and watching their favorite show and watching art forms that help empower them and help inspire them, which really is the most important part to go and do their work in whatever field they're in. And so art is integral and it's so important and it needs to be well understood, well shared and, and embraced. And experienced, right? You know, it's just like you said, there's a lot of broke artists, you know, I, I know a few, but there are, you know, artists and just yeah. the, the vulnerability of producing something and telling the world, like Seth Godin says, you know, here, I did this, you know, and it's, it's vulnerable act because it's almost like it's a part of yourself, but you've given birth to it and it's out there kind of having its own, own life now. And so it is, it is um, quite, quite the adventure basically to, to live a life without exploring any of the arts, I, I feel is a disservice to, to your soul, you know? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right, definitely agree. Awesome, awesome. And so the last thing I'll tell, you, tell is uh, Dr. Robert Root Bernstein and his wife, Michelle Bernstein, they did a book called The Sparks of Genius. And they really talked about how the sciences and arts really push each other. Like a scientist will invent something that will inspire an, an artist to, to pr produce something. And then the, the science world looks at what the, art, what the artists are doing and then that gives them ideas. And it's almost like this yin and yang partnership. Do you sometimes feel, feel that? Because you produce some art with your photography and pictures of space, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, completely. Um, and so, for instance, a good, a good example of that is sci-fi writing and movie making pushing science. And so some of the concepts that were being written in sci-fi in the 1950s and 40s were actually created and, <laughs> and done. Um, and utilizing the inspiration from that. When they were kids, they were reading that, and they're like, oh, and then all of a sudden I made it when one certain technology started to be done. And on the, on the reversal, on the inverse, there is electricity being created to be able to make instruments and different new sounds and to make electronic instruments and you know the electric guitar and the keyboard and all these different cool synthesizers and all these different sounds that will never have been heard if engineering didn't do its work first. 
And so the it's, two, a, it's a partnership. Exactly. It's a, it's a pendulum right? and they keep coming and, and that's the wave. That's the frequency, right? It's always iteration, the cycle of movement. And so it's always going to be that way. It's always going to keep happening. The beauty of it all. And so the wonderful quote that I love is the difference between science fiction and science is time. Yep. Exactly what you just said. And so, well, uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you have your website up. So people, if people wanted to reach out to you and find you, they can go where? JoeyJefferson.com. Oh, it is up. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, great, great. So you're on LinkedIn, you're on, you're on um, your website, uh, you're on Instagram, Instagram as well at Spaceman. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I will. So definitely, and um, go definitely check out future shows um, that Caltech is having. If you're in Southern California, stay here for more research and just more content about intercultural creativity, how our cultural lenses um, interplay with our creative thinking, but also how the arts are a part of them both. Our arts can help us be better observers, cur um, increase our curiosity and our ability to perspective shift and adapt. And our arts can also help us be culturally competent and connect with others from different lived experiences. Thank you so much for watching. And we're just go before we end and say a full goodbye, I wanted to leave you with some notes singing notes from the wonderful cast of From the Earth to the Moon. Can you say the, those two verse, verses? Um, wherever we're led, whatever will be, the future is ahead and it's waiting for me. From the earth to the moon and to come back around. It's no end to our tune because we won't stop breaking ground. And those are amazing words to end with. Everyone who is watching this, don't stop breaking ground. We need your creative ideas. The future is waiting for you. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Mr. Joseph Jefferson. We thank you for sharing your art with us, for being vulnerable, for taking risks and showing us the world that we have no idea what's inside of us if we just you know, take that risk, take that step forward and fly to the moon. So thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.